paper kind of emerged, I suppose, out of my uh, dissatisfaction with a number of things to do with uh, the way we classify things as archaeologists. And also, uh, as we are talking about yesterday in, in a similar session about the use of analogies as well, which hopefully I'll be able to explore in some detail. So back to Dreek, Britain, I suppose. West Central Scotland, this is the, the kind of area <coughs> that we'll be talking about. So studies focusing on the Iron Age of Scotland continue to see social structure and hierarchical ways where hill forts are interpreted as being at the top of a social triangle with smaller sites, often in low-lying positions, regarded as being of lesser social status. Ian Banks, for instance, suggested that there was some kind of hierarchy in settlement types and that it was possible to consider hill fort territories where each large hill fort controlled an area with smaller hill forts or settlement types. These types of hierarchical models were heavily influenced by interpretations advanced by Cunliffe in the 1980s, who argued that the hill fort was the residence of the king and his retinue, that larger farms should be seen as residences of noble families, the smaller enclosures and open settlements being the homes of lower ranks and client farmers. There are, of course, a number of problems with this kind of interpretation, not least especially in Scotland, because they're inherently caught up with redundant classification systems of sites which see forts or see hilltop sites as forts and lowland sites as settlements or homesteads. The majority of enclosed sites in West Central Scotland are, in fact, very small. This is you know, four case study areas that, which I looked at, uh, enclosing less of a quarter of a hectare in, in extent. And many of the hill fort sites are, in fact, of comparable size to lowland crop mark sites, which means that interpretations do with social hierarchy based on the ideas that forts are somehow of greater social status is difficult to, to sustain. The problem of social interpretation in relation to site morphology has recently been uh, critiqued by Andy Wigley in the, the Welsh Marches. Building on the work of Wigley, uh, I advanced new ways of approaching settlement morphology based on the size, shape, form and orientation, which has begun to critically reassess these interpretations. For instance, as can be seen from these four rank size plots of the four case study areas in, in West Central Scotland, it can be seen that the majority of sites are less than a quarter of a hectare in extent, while there are only a small and quite distinct group of sites that are over one hectare in extent. Indeed, there are only 16 sites in the whole of Strathclyde area that occupy areas of one hectare or more. As can be seen from this map, these sites are spread throughout the region, and it could be argued that they perform a different social role compared to the other smaller enclosed sites in the area. However, given the limited evidence we have from these sites, it is difficult to sustain that they perform some sort of elite social role. It appears that they did not control production or access to craft materials, or use exotic prestige items. It is therefore difficult to sustain a chieftain, top-down, and central place model for, the, for this uh, archaeology, as the likes of Ian Banks and Ralston and Cunliffe have suggested. Only the limited excavations have been carried out in these large sites, providing us with tentative evidence regarding the ways in which these sites were constructed and used, or the practices that took place within them. At Harpercroft and Ayrshire, there was only limited evidence to suggest there was even roundhouses at the site, while the artefact assemblage was fairly utilitarian, consisting of crude handmade pottery, which appears to be early, early Iron Age in date on accounts that similarities with ceramic assemblage from the small palisaded site of the Leven, also in Ayrshire. <coughs> well, there's also a number of shale bangles which appear ubiquitous across, across the area. This rather limited evidence tells us that these sites were occupied in the first millennium BC and that their occupants were tied in with wider cult cultural and social networks of West Central Scotland, as evidenced by the use of cr crude made pottery and shale bangles. However, apart from these conclusions, little else can be said about these sites and there's certainly no evidence to suggest that the occupants were of high status. Indeed, the type of material that's found in these sites, the crude handmade pottery, the shield bangles, the core stone tools, are found in the smaller sites as well. In fact, many of the smaller sites often have a richer assemblage, although most of them, there's more excavation of these sites, I suppose, as can be seen at sites such as Brayhead in Glasgow, where there's considerable evidence for craft specialisation in the form of shale working, which can be seen in, in, lots of, in many of the other small sites as well. The site of Bray Heads, located close to the southern bank of the River Clyde, is one of the few complete excavated enclosed sites in West Central Scotland, and was dem demonstrated to survive as a complex multi-period site, which consisted of at least, at least six phases of occupation. The earliest phase of the site consisted of, of a timber palisade, which has been made of carbon dated between 800 and, 4, 800 and 480 BC. This was followed by two further phases of occupation, represented by the construction of a second palisade and what appears to be an unenclosed phase. In the fourth phase of the site, 
uh, there was three large ditches uh, excavated, which eliminated any further activity at the site, even though they were left to silt up. The fifth phase of the site was again defined by a series of up to three different palisades and dated between 400 and 200 BC, before a final unenclosed phase of occupation. From the waterlogged deposits recovered at Brayhead, we can see that oak was the main type of wood used in the construction of different palisades from all the phases, which were used to enclose the site. Sorry. And as evidence suggests, from other palisaded sites, oak tends to be the, the, the dominant species used. So in addition to the well-preserved waterlogged deposits, a number of charcoal samples and bulk samples were also produced, also produced evidence from different types of wood that were used at the site. Alder was the most dominant species uh, recognised at the site, representing 48% of the charcoal assemblage, while, while oak represented 28, 26%. Other species were represented in charcoal assemblage and probably used at the site include hazel, birch, willow and cherry. It should be noted, however, that it is important to be aware of the problems in trying to recognise wood use at a site on the basis of a charcoal assemblage. For instance, bulk charcoal samples examined at Brayhead do not suggest that oak was primarily used in the construction of palisades, and it's only because of the unique waterlogged deposits that we can structure as a detailed picture of wood use at the site. This is a problem that needs to be taken into account when trying to build a picture of wood use across settlements in West Central Scotland, as taphonomic conditions do not always mean that there is evidence to securely test these kind of uh, ideas. So we've seen in this evidence that specific use of trees for specific purposes at Brayhead. The high percentages of alder recovered from the site suggests that was, this is the most commonly exploited species at Brayhead. This tree grows in waterlogged environments, and as Bray, Brayhead is located close to the River Clyde, it's possible to suggest that it was readily accessible and used by the people who live there. The alder piers have been used for a number of purposes, including the construction of roundhouses, for internal house features, fencing, and probably for fuel. It appears that oak was used exclusively in the construction of the enclosing palisades rather than the domestic structures. The posts and planks used to construct these enclosing features would have come from large mature trees and would have provided a strong and durable material which would have produced a smooth, regular and distinct facade, while other trees would have been e easily used to construct a, a palisade, an effective barrier, it appears that no other tree was suitable for this feature. This led the excavators to suggest that along with the aesthetic qualities of the oak timber, <laughs> there may have been other factors associated with use of oak, which may have been to do with the, dis the display of social status and prestige, which was the main reason they were used in their construction. So the idea that Iron Age enclosures and houses were intimately linked with ideas to do with symbolism and cosmology, it's obviously a long history in Iron Age research, and we're all familiar with Parker Pearson's model of Iron Age cosmology. However, there's a danger that these cosmological <coughs> models advanced by Alexis Fitzpatrick, Oswald and Parker Pearson are adopted uncritically, and that interpretations such as the one advanced by the excavators at Brayhead reduce all aspects of Iron Age life to a symbol or a metaphor, without addressing the very real, practical powers that these cosmologies may have had. For instance, as Brad Bradley hi highlights, for many in the Western world, ritual and religious belief are relegated to the margins of daily life. Therefore, the ways in which many archaeologists have interpreted ritual in the past is that it's seen as beyond the limits of daily practice. It's consigned to special people, special places, special material culture, and so on. Bradley instead argued that there were two strands of, or conceptions of ritual which are important if you're going to understand the past better. The first reflects the idea that rituals express fundamental pro propositions about the world and are associated with religious beliefs and therefore ascribe to the supernatural. The second considers the outward characteristics of rituals are rituals and emphasises that they are really performances carried out according to convention. Similarly, uh, as it's been explored by Brooke in relation to the Late Bronze Age, where she argued that in the past people would have had seen ritual and rituals in practical terms, and therefore cosmologies and their associated rituals were not just symbolic systems, they were in fact fundamental practical actions of daily life, which enabled people to understand the world as well as successfully getting on in it providing a logic for action, as well as providing an explanation for the universe. Brooke noted that as ritual is often not seen as fulfilling a useful ra a rational role, it does not meet modern Western criteria for practicality. It therefore is frequently as described or interpreted by archaeologists as non-functional or rational action. Ritual is therefore interpreted as a metaphor or a symbol, fulfilling or reflecting some other non-functional purpose. This is of course a legacy of post-enlightenment thought and rationalism. rationalism in which scientific knowledge is prioritised as the only way of knowing the world, and that as a result, 
the natural world became an object of study, legitimising its control and exploitation. These ideas still pervade many of our interpretations, which often reduce, uh, reduced a series of dualisms which dis describe the way and define the world. If we accept ritual as a kind of practice, we can move beyond the idea that the only function of Irish houses or enclosures is to communicate or act as a metaphor for how Irish people and, uh, and the, how Irish people understood the world. In addition, if we begin to see ritual as a normal form of action in the daily lives of people in Iron Age, we are able to explore how it operates more fully, as well as tracing, it, tracing how it changed and developed over time, and in different areas. Therefore, following Brooke and Bradley's arguments, it can be suggested that Iron Age houses and closures were constructed and laid out in specific, appropriate ways <coughs> that materialised practical systems of cosmological value and meaning. They therefore did not just act as metaphors for Iron Age cosmological understandings of the world. They in fact emerged out of people's real and practical understandings of the world, producing and reproducing social reality. Houses were material embodiments of cosmological understandings and not just models of them. So in Iron Age society, cosmological or ritual concerns were also part of quite specific practical concerns, and that the use of particular types of stone or wood may have had quite specific practical uses, perhaps in very real and tangible ways for the people that built these enclosures. These may have fulfilled specific spiritual con concerns, but they would also have been important for the successful and proper use of the structure. Houses and enclosures were, there, were thus shaped by the spe specific practical concerns and logics of the world, materialising culturally specific values, aims and rationales. Concerns which to us as modern Western observers would appear to be metaphors tied up with ritual practices were to Iron Age people aspects of a successful social strategy, fundamental to their understanding of the world and their successful place within it. Now, while these arguments allow us to further break down traditional divisions of the sacred and profane in understanding Iron Age's life, the symbolic aspects of different materials continue to be interpreted and assigned meaning by archaeologists in uncritical ways, which are often caught up with privileging just one aspect of their materiality. The symbolic significance of objects and architectural features or architectural features is often associated with the vigil hegemony of Western thought, which promotes this characteristic of architecture as being of primary importance. The privilege, privileging of the visual aesthetic over haptic or oral experiences is a particular modern Western way of responding to architecture, and therefore affects the way we as archaeologists evaluate the qualities of architecture were important in the past. And while there's been a growing interest in the multi-sensory approach to archaeology, Iron Age studies have in general been slow to adopt these kinds of interpretations. For instance, the oak timbers that were used to construct the Palace of Bray Head were of a distinct, because they were of a distinctive visual quality, straight, durable material, but while they were used for their practical purposes of enclosures, the excavators argued that they must have been used to display for symbolic purposes, power and prestige. We see in this symbolic interpretation a reinforcement of the ritual practical dualisms which have dominated Iron Age studies, which restrict our understanding of the period. These interpretations limit our understanding of the ways in which people in the Iron Age defined themselves, negotiated their identities, understood their worlds and assembled their communities. Interpretations of how Iron Age people were used different materials are especially relevant if we acknowledge the active role that architectural materials may have had through their effective agency and perhaps their associated personhood in assembling both structures and communities. One way of understanding the active role, one way of approaching or understanding the active role that architectural materials may have had in assessing communi assembling communities, is to think about the ways in which Irish people interacted with the material. For instance, instead of thinking about how Irish people would impose their plans, designs, or to, onto inanimate but suitable materials, it can be suggested that they instead entered into a, di a dialogue and engaged in active partnerships with the material and their physical qualities and that through these dialogues, houses and enclosures would emerge. The physical materiality of the architectural materials would therefore have played an active role in shaping the relationships of meaning that they embodied, and therefore the monuments that they helped to create. So the particular timbers were not merely selected for their utilitarian or symbolic suitability, but in a sense entered into an active partnership with the architects, and therefore helped create the enclosures and houses themselves. Partnerships were reinforced by the specific qualities of the material, their shape, their colour, their hardness, their durability, but also through the haptic, oral and visual qualities. Therefore, the use of particular types of wood or stone of different qualities uh, from the different parts of the landscape were used in the construction of enclosures for these specific qualities, helping materialise and perhaps legitimising them. While these arguments allow us to explore how certain materials can be processional or relational, Chantelle Conneller suggests that a critique that could be levelled at them is that they continue to force distinctions between socially imbued material of culture and inanimate and exploitable material of nature. 
This is, of course, problematic given the arguments advanced in relation to the practical aspects of ritual and cosmological significance, the ar active architectural material. Cornella argues that a way of addressing this problem is to question the distinctions we create between concepts and things. Cornella suggests that we should understand that these concepts that we attach to material are not in the mind cultural representations that are layered onto things, but are identical with the things themselves. An example of the way in which we can approach this idea of material is not just socially or culturally imbued with potency, but is rather in itself potent, has been demonstrated by Martin Holbrad in relation to the powder Achi, used by Afro-Cuban diviners. The powerful powder is not assigned power by the users, it is in itself powerful. This example is potentially quite significant, and while we do not have the same kind of privilege that Holbrad had in being able to communicate with subjects, we have to be cautious in applying anthropological analogy with interpretations of the past. This idea allows uh, new ways to explore potentially ways that Irish people in the past may have understood power. If we accept that different materials could have been understood by these kinds of ways by people in Iron Age, this would have profound implications as to the ways in which material would have helped assemble people's identities and communities the ways in which the landscape and the things within it were understood, controlled and exploited, and the ways in which Irish society was organised. This is especially relevant given the arguments advanced here in relation to the active role of things, the practical aspects of ritual and cosmological significance structures. Therefore, by thinking about material in this way, and not just this special or unusual material, we can move beyond understanding material as being made up of me mechanical properties and impose cultural meaning, and instead recognise that these concepts are utterly indivisible. The engagement with these specific aspects of the materiality of oak meant that by building closures with this material, these sites, these builders of these sites, and the people that lived within them, were also actively engaging with the potency, which was related to their durability, their strength, their distinctive aesthetic, aesthetic qualities, as well as the significant properties of the landscape and the places from which the trees were taken. The potency associated with these different characteristics of timber would have been socially mediated as people worked with and engaged with it from its felling to its transport to its manipulation and its incorporation into various structures. The engagement with material would have required communal action, representing shared experiences in which in turn created communities. Communities which can be thought of as assemblages of people, places, monuments, or in this case, trees. The idea... I'm kind of running out of, bit of time here, a wee bit. These ideas allow us to understand why certain materials were used in construction of houses or enclosures during the Iron Age. Moreover, moreover, these ideas challenge anthropocentric interpretations which we have, which dominate archaeological understandings of the past. They allow people, us to explore the new ways in, in which society in the Iron Age was structured, ways in which challenge the dominant notions of hierarchy, that functionless, interp functionless exploitation of the landscape which relegates ideas to do with ritual and cosmology to secondary roles in Irish, pe Irish people's <coughs> lives. With the, these ideas in mind, how can we approach ideas of social structure? One recent way has been advanced by Sharples, who <coughs> stressed the complex and socially important nature of gift giving and exchange, as well as the idea of labour being used as a form of potlatch. By exploring this idea in relation to the importance of material and creating the importance of places, we can explore new ways of interpreting Irish social structure. Sharples highlighted that the creation of even small enclosing works would have required labour of a substantial number of people. For instance, at Bray Head, which was defined by in the first phase by a relatively small timber palisades, which have, would have required a substantial number of prime oak timbers to construct. As has been discussed, these trees may have had properties which meant that they were required for the construction of a successful and powerful enclosure. The small group that was going to be living in Brayhead would not have had access to the large amount of resources, as well as the labour, to complete the project by themselves, and must have required the help of neighbouring groups in order to complete this enclosure. These neighbouring households from the wider community would have, been, would have brought them brought with them trees from their local areas, which would have in itself required considerable labour from their felling, preparation and transport, which may have entailed ritual practices, especially if these trees were significant. Once at the site, people would set up preparing the ground, excavating slots within these timbers which would be erected. Therefore, we can see in this even relatively small and simple enclosure, the resources would have been required and the labour that would have been expended would have been very large, suggesting something of particular authority of the inhabitants of the site. <coughs> and the ability to assemble labour and resources to construct it. I'm just going to skip to the end of this. It was too much to say as usual. Well, I know. <laughs> it's always the same. So, this highly competitive heterogeneous. Basically, 
<laughs> so there's a constant kind of uh, idea of, of gift giving and uh, assembling uh, resources which would have needed to be reciprocated. So there's this constant uh, construction of, of ditches and palisades in these, these places. And these sites, you can see uh, all, all the ones that have been excavated have multiple phases of construction. Uh, and, and so no one would have been dominant in a sense that there would have been constant competition of resources uh, using potentially important material to assemble communities. I'll just stop there because I'm going to run out of time, but thanks for listening. Anyway. Okay.